Hi, this is Steven Greg again, and we're going over my um, life story. And of course, the message is called The Mindset of a Trailblazer. So, thank you for being here again, and I'm just going to go ahead and continue with what we were just talking about in my last message. And, you know, I, I started to go to um, uh, FITM. FITM is Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising. That was after I moved out here from San Jose. I came to um, Los Angeles, California. I decided not to go to the school out in San Francisco. I wanted to come out this way. So I came out here, like I said, I came out for two reasons. One was because of a person, uh, this woman I was, I was chasing at the time. And then I also came because I didn't want to go to the San Francisco school. I wanted to come to the Los Angeles one. My sister was living out here at the time. So me and my mom, um, I convinced my mom to pack up and leave you know, behind um, where we lived, which was my dad, and there was a lot of stuff, and you've heard the story about my dad. So we moved out here to uh, Los Angeles. We lived there for a while. I hated Los Angeles. Man, I hated it. I didn't like the area. I mean, the people that were around my area, um, I loved the people because, remember, I had, um, I had, I had done some things at that time that, uh, you know, I loved, I loved the area where I lived but because of the people that were there, but there were some challenges that was going on. You know, and I, but the environment didn't sit with me well. You know, it would always make me nervous and, and agile and, and worried and concerned all the time. Just because it was, was not a, it wasn't like where I lived in San Jose. It was just a little, lot more going on. That's all. And so because of that, you know, um, I got into FITM, Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising, and I went to school there. Um, and then I was also. Uh, you know, while I was in school, I was working at a video store, and I was, I think, 17 or 18 years old, 17 or 18, yeah, I think about 18 years old, and as I was working there, my, me and my sister, we got into a big argument, and so she wasn't super fired up about me living with her any longer, um, but while I was at school, the hard part was for me was the drawing, because I couldn't draw, my, my drawing was horrible, and if you know anything about fashion design, you have to know how to draw those patterns, and draw them and make them look appropriate so that when you create the, the patterns they can look nice for the clothes and when it got to the drawing time that's when I buckled and one of the things I realized about myself and my character at that time is that I found that a lot of the time when I when it got pushed up against the wall when I got up against the wall and, and, and I felt that emotional pull saying Stephen you can't do it you know what I did I believed it that was the hard part for me I believed it and so you know what I did I quit I quit the school, you know, my mom invested all this money, I moved all the way out here, and I quit the school just because I couldn't draw. I wasn't willing to learn. See, one of the things I've learned is I have to have a high willingness to learn and a high willingness to accept change. And I didn't. I didn't have that willingness to learn, so you know, I quit. And then, from the time I quit, then me and my sister got into a big argument because she hated me at that point and wanted me out of the house, so I did. I left the house and, you know, <laughs> again, uh, a lemon came, I had to move, and I turned that lemon to lemonade because I, I got my own place in Inglewood, and it was a, a two-bedroom condo, and I was about to buy this condo. Again, I was living now living with that girl because I had um, started dating her, and I was living in there, and I was selling cars. I went to Inglewood Toyota. Now, Inglewood Toyota was fun because I had just started selling cars because this guy came into the um, video store with a Toyota hat on, and I said, are you hiring? He said, yeah, come on down, I'll get you a job, and he got me a job selling cars. And that was when I was 18 years old. Now the hard part about selling cars when you're 18, you're around people that are 30, 40, 50 years old. And you know, when you're around that age of different age group, it's it's tough. You know, it's a car sale is a hard deal. So I'm selling cars, I'm living in this place. Um and now they also offer me a place to rent to own. So that that place I was living, I could actually own it if I wanted to. So I had put a thousand dollar deposit down and I was owning the, the condo. And I remember me and my girlfriend, we used to have dance parties there because, you know, I was still partying and I'm still 18 years old going out to Hollywood and stuff like that. And I remember being in that, uh, that, that condo and we loved it. We had it decorated. We had the, the, the walls painted, the carpet new, and we had it. It was a really nice condo. But, man, it was just so ridiculous what I did. And that was when it was only like 100 grand. And the reason I didn't buy it, because of fear. Because of fear. I didn't know what it meant to own a condo. So I let that opportunity slip by and then I remember we looked at a house out in Ontario. That's when Ontario, the airport, I don't even think the airport was built. We went out there and we looked at a house in an area over there 
we put five thousand down. It was a ninety-nine thousand dollar house. And I remember driving back and forth, looking at the house, watching it get built, and we were gonna buy it. And I put the five thousand dollars down, and then one day I remember going out there, and it was raining. It was a rainy day, kind of like it is today. And as I'm driving out there, I'm feeling in my heart. I'm like. Really, do I really want to do this drive all the time? Do I really want to come back? What if I lose my job? I started coming up with all these excuses of why I shouldn't live way out there to, to, and you know for this car, or for this house. So you know what I did? Right as the house almost got finished, I got my five thousand deposit back. Didn't buy the house. That house went from ninety nine thousand all the way up to six hundred thousand dollars. So that was a, 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 one of those being in the right place at the right time twice and didn't take advantage of the opportunity. You know, and, and I look back at it and it all goes back to fear. Every bad decision that I made most of the time it was because of fear. It was because I was afraid. I was a chicken. I was a wimp. Bottom line, that's what I was. I was a wimp in my heart. I was afraid to, to commit. That's what I think it was more than anything. I was afraid to commit to something that could better me or, you know, there's a risk. And in anything we do in life, there's a risk or there's a reward. And it's a fork in the road. we got to choose which direction we're going to go. And most of the time, I was making these bad choices of not committing. And so that's what happened. So I went to, like I said, I was at Fitum. I quit Fitum. And then I was selling cars. And then I had to make another decision. Um, I had to make another big decision. And that decision was to um, move to another car dealership. Um, because when I was at this car dealership, um, I was... You know, I had, I had to go to one called uh, Pete Ellis. I don't know if you know, remember Pete Ellis. I had a little bouncing ball. I went to Pete Ellis for it. Um, by the way, I'm looking down at my notes because I can't remember everything I went through in order. So I have to look at my notes sometimes. But, you know, I went to Pete Ellis Ford, and it was another dealership. And when I went there, it was a bigger dealership. Um, and they had to, it was a pivotal point for me, another one, another big move that I had to make. Because one of the things they told me I had to do was I had to cut my hair. Now, back in those days, that was in the late 80s, uh, so 88, 89, and if you didn't remember, that was the long jerry curl days. And I had a 15 and a half inch jerry curl down my back. It was short on top, and it was long curling in the back. Really nice looking jerry curl. Well, nice looking as, you know, as much as it could be. I looked like ready for the world back in the day. <laughs> but uh, I loved my curl, because, man, it took me a long time to grow that hair. Because that hair used to get me all kinds of... Stuff probably I shouldn't deserve back in high school, but I'm gonna tell you when I had to go to Pete Ellis and they said, "Man, you gotta cut your hair," because in Inglewood they didn't care, but Pete Ellis, Pete Ellis was coming towards Orange County and they said you gotta cut that hair off. And I had to make a decision. That was a tough decision, man. I I struggled with that for a long time because I don't want to cut my hair. I didn't know what I'd look like without my hair. You know, my hair defined me. I, I was so insecure as a man that my hair defined me. And I was thinking, what if I don't have my hair? How, what, 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 how am I, how am I going to go dancing? How am I going to meet people? And girls ain't going to like me and I'm going to look crazy. You know, all these stupid thoughts would come through my head because of my hair. I kind of idolized my hair. That's kind of how I felt about it at the time. And that wasn't good. So you know what I did? I had to make a decision. I said, you know, what's more important to me? Provided for my family, buying this house, or having long hair? So I decided to go ahead and, and I... You know, cut my hair, and I went to the car dealership, and it was great because I, you know, I became one of the top salespeople. I was number two in the dealership for a long time behind a guy named Rudolph Graham. And I remember my buddy Ronnie Young used to always throw contests for me to beat Rudolph because Rudolph would work day and night. I mean, when I say day and night, he'd be there at seven in the morning, and he would leave at nine at night every single day. I, he didn't have a life. He, that's all he did was sell cars, so he would be number one. And I wasn't willing to work that kind of number, so I worked enough to be number two, sometimes number three. In, in the dealership, but every once in a while, um, Ronnie would throw a contest out and say, Stephen, you know, I want you to, to um, try to beat Ronnie. I can't, you can't beat Rudolph, can you? You can't beat Rudolph. And he would tempt me on it. And I said, of course I can beat Rudolph. You can make me a bet. So he'd make me a bet, and then I'd stay, and I'd do bell to bells, and, you know, 12-hour days, 14-hour days, and then that was the months that I beat him. But, uh, you know, when I was at the car dealership, I, I had, I, 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 had some situations happen because I had a really, really, really depressing moment um, that came over me at this car dealership. Because, now you got to remember, I'm 18, 19 years old, around 40 and 50 year olds, and I'm now killing it. I'm kicking everybody's butt. I'm doing really well selling cars. 
And some of the older guys were not super pleased with me. They were, you know, some of them probably were jealous of it, that the fact that I was so young but and doing so well. And I remember this one guy, I can't remember his name, but he, I remember he drove a brown 280Z. And I remember he came up to me one day and we were standing all on the point. The point is where you stand out looking for the prospects calling up. So I was standing there um, talking to him and he said something to me that devastated me. And I didn't know it devastated me at the time. I felt it after. You know how you get punched in the jaw and it don't hurt right now that much because you're in the heat of the moment. But then two, two days later, you start swelling up and it starts hurting and you feel it then. Or, you know, yeah, so that's kind of what happened. I got hit in my jaw or in my ego, my pride. And, you know, I didn't feel it immediately. I felt it a, a few days later. And what he said was something that, you know, really hurt me. And this is what he said. He said, Stephen, you know, yeah, you, you might be able to be a great sales here at the car dealership, but you can't do anything else. You can't sell anything else. This is the only thing you can do. And because that was the only thing I'd ever done at that point. I had never done anything else, really. And so I said, wow, I can't do anything else, huh? I said, yeah. I said, yeah. But, and, you know, I was a smart alley little kid. So I said, yeah, but, yeah, you, you can say that. I said, what, what school did you go to for graduate? What school did you graduate? He goes, I graduated this one, I got this degree, I got that degree. He goes to his car, he pulls out his different degrees to show me and to show everyone how stupid I am and how smart he is because he has all these degrees. So he shows all me all these degrees and I said, okay, so let me understand. You went to school for 10 years to get those degrees. You got those degrees, now you're at a car dealership selling cars, you're making less money than me. So who's stupid? And that was my like, smart out like, ego, you know, blocking attitude I had towards him. And, you know, I, I really forget, I hope he forgives me for even saying something like that, because that would probably really not the right thing to say, but that's how I felt, you know, I'm just being real, that's how I felt. And I said it, and then, you know, we went on and kept on bagging and just kept on our day. A day later, you know, I was sitting at my desk, and I was really thinking, man, you know, maybe I can't do anything else. You know, how, do I, can I do something else? I don't know. I, I don't want to sell cars the rest of my life, so maybe I can't do anything else. And then my buddy Ronnie, Ronnie was my, um, my mentor at the time. He was my, um, he was my manager. He came up to me and he gave me a book. And it was called uh, How to, um, uh, how to Sell, you know, uh, from Tom Hopkins. It was um, The Magic of, I, f I forgot what it's called, something about seeking, uh, how to sell anything. Um, I, I can't remember the name of it right, right offhand, but Ronnie came over to me and he gave me this book and, oh, oh, How to Master the Art of Selling Anything, that's what it was called. He gave me this book and he said, Stephen, you know what, bro, you can sell anything. He said, if you can sell cars, you can sell anything. I believe in you. And, you know, at that time I needed someone to believe in me because I didn't believe in me. You know, I had already got, got fired from the um, Inglewood Toyota. I didn't tell you that story. That's a whole other topic of itself, a character issue again. I got fired from there, and then now I was working at a, a, you know, left the other place, a video store, and now I'm at this dealership, and I don't, I didn't believe in myself. I didn't have confidence in myself, so I got really, 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 really depressed. And what I did is, um, I put my head down on the desk, and I remember every single day I would come into work, and I'd put my head on the desk, and I'd just go to sleep for eight hours. And, you know, I'm on straight commission, so they couldn't, they didn't care. I mean, well, they did care, but it was a tough time for me. You know, Ronnie was like, man, you know, something's wrong with you, bro. You, you got to go figure this out. And I was like, oh, I'll, I'll be all right. I'll, I'll be fine. And I remember one sentence my mom said to me. My mom said one sentence. And she was talking, she used to always say, you know, put God first. That was one of the sentences she used to say. And I was trying to put God first, but I didn't know what that meant. So I just stayed depressed. I just stayed depressed for a long time, and then Ronnie said to me, Stephen, you need to get out of here. You need to go. You need to go for a month, take a month off, and go and, you know, have some fun. Go, go, you know, spend time with your girlfriend, go do whatever you're going to do. So that's what I did. I took my month off, and I went to Catalina Island. Um, Catalina Island is not too far from here in Orange County, and I went over there, and, you know, I was still mentally messed up. <laughs> I mean, it was so funny, because we used to go jet skiing in Catalina Island. I remember this vividly. We were jet skiing, and I remember thinking I saw a shark. And so I was so scared to get back in the boat again. You know, I lived by fear. I was afraid to get back in the water because my mind saw a shark. Now, come to find out, it is a shark-infested area over there, but in my mind, I thought I saw a shark. I didn't necessarily see one. I just thought I did. And it's amazing how your brain can see things that aren't there. 
and then you can develop a fear because of it. And that's what I did. I lived by fear, man. I was petrified by fear. You know that kind of fear where you're so scared to move, you don't know what to do? That's how I was because my girlfriend was trying to pull me back on that jet ski and trying to drag me on and I was, tug it was like a tug of war for me to get back on that jet ski because of something I envisioned in my mind. See, all this time, I, I kept envisioning the wrong thing. I kept seeing the wrong thing. And you know, you're gonna become like the way you see yourself. That was one of the things I learned years ago is that you're gonna become how you see yourself. And I saw myself as afraid. I saw myself as insecure. I saw myself as a party animal. I saw myself in different ways that weren't, weren't benefiting to me. And so that's what happened. I went to Catalina and you know, went over there for about a month. And then after I came back, after a month, you know, I went back to the car dealership and I said, Ronnie, you know, dude, I gotta quit. I gotta quit this dealership and I gotta go do something else. So I did. I quit the dealership and I went to a, a company called Circuit City. Now you may not know what Circuit City is, but Circuit City was an electronics company back in those days. And I went to Circuit City and um, it was uh, interesting. I was a cocky, like I said, cocky kid that thought he knew how to sell. Um, believed in himself kind of, but not really, you know, but I would put on a bold front. I would act like I knew what I was talking about. So there was this guy named Mike there who was the top salesperson in the entire company of Circuit City. And they had offices and stores all around the world. And at that time, this was the number one store in the number one major appliance department, number one um, parts department, all that stuff, number one stereo department. So Mike was the number one person in the entire company in the, the number one department, which is the stereo department. So we were all standing there, and a manager was standing there one day, and Mike was talking smack about beating me in this and that. And I said, Mike, I could beat you in this department. If you, hey, just put me over there. I'll beat him. I was talking to Ed Foreman, put me over there. I'll beat him. And they wouldn't put me over there, Ed Rios, actually. They wouldn't put me over there. But again, you know, that mindset, that fear was, can I beat him? Can I do it? Can I do it? And... You know, it, it just really messed with me because I would always question, can I be better? Can I do more? Can I, you know, get out of this situation? Can I grow? Can I be a better salesperson at this point? Can I do something else? I'm still debating, can I still do something else? So I, you know, started working hard in the major appliance department and I did become number one in that department, in that store. Um, but some, some turns of events started to happen and I met a friend. Um, I had a friend named Malcolm, Malcolm Turner at the time, and he, you know, he, he became one of my good friends at the place, and he had three beautiful daughters, um, one, two of them were just born not long after we met, and one of them was, his, his daughter was a little bit older, and, you know, he was my fight buddy, you know what a fight buddy is, the person that goes to look at the boxing matches, me and Matt, um, Mal used to go to the fights, we used to watch the fight all the time, and, you know, just to tell you, the, the, the biggest um, fight that we used to watch and we watched together was Buster Douglas and Mike Tyson. That was the pinnacle because Mike was my guy. I had been watching Mike knock cats out left and right all the time and man, I used to idolize Mike and we used to go to the fights and stuff and there was one day that we were, I was going to go dancing that Saturday night and it was at the, the Palladium. They had a pajama party so you know, you got you know, 21 years old, 20 years old, you got to go to the pajama party, you know, that's the place to be. So I'm ready to go, I'm all dressed, ready to go. I go over to Malcolm's house to watch the fight, so watch the fight, and what happens when Mike gets knocked out, out, and I literally went into another depression, man. I mean, I felt like my father got beat up. I didn't even go to the fight party, I didn't do the dance that night, I didn't even go to the play him that night. I was so discouraged and down, as if that his life made a difference for me. And sometimes what I realize is that, you know, I'm looking at other people play life, and I'm putting myself in there and really not even playing life myself at the full. But I was discouraged and down again and, you know, all frustrated and discouraged because Mike Tyson lost a boxing match. You know, it was ridiculous. But, you know, that's what happened. And it was uh, a challenging time. And, you know, I had some big things happen to me that day. Some life-changing things happened in 2000, uh, 1998, 1999. But, you know, that was a, a pivotal point for me. Um, when I started realizing that I'm looking at everyone else's life, I'm looking at everybody else play life hard. I'm sitting here going to jobs and I'm living by fear. I'm not a man of integrity. I'm, I'm partying all the time. I'm looking at my buddy Malcolm with two children and a wife and, 
you know, they're going through their struggles or whatever, but, you know, at least he had a family. And I'm, I'm thinking, man, I want that, but how do I get that? So it was just a really, really, really tough time for me. So I just wanted to share that today. That's the message I want to share today, but I just want you to know that, you know, life is not going to be easy for you. When you're going through your challenges in life, uh, you got to kind of look at them from the good because, you know, God works all things for the good for those who love him. And, you know, at that time, things weren't going in the right direction for me, you know, and, but there was a pivotal point that happened. When I say a pivotal point, you're going to hear in my next video that pivotal point that literally drove me a different direction and that was the path that got me to where I am today. So I'll be sharing that with you in a moment.